April 1st. Uh, I will call to order the meeting of the personnel committee. The first order, second order business actually is approval of minutes. Can I get a motion? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you. Any changes, discussion, updates? If not, all in favor can vote aye. 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 All right. Those are passed. Um, public appearances for non agenda items. Anyone anywhere? No. Okay, we'll move on. Agenda items. First is city administrator recruitment update. So we, as you know, have four finalists for city administrator. We are very excited about next week, Thursday and Friday. Uh, our first step in the process are panel interviews. Um, these are one hour interviews with each finalist. We have a, uh, a really great balanced uh, panel for that, a five member panel. And then in the afternoon, we have what are called community panel presentations. So. Um, each candidate has been given a topic and they were sent that topic actually just yesterday, um, actually two days ago, so they could actually prepare a presentation for a whole nother set of um, panel members, about five, um, that will basically score them on their presentation, the content, their approach, a number of different factors. Um, and then we'll have the public reception from 6.30 to 7.30 in the council chambers. Um, we will have a virtual option for those that can't attend in person. And so we do hope to ask each candidate four questions. And then we'll just take turns asking one um, so that not the same person gets the question at the beginning. Uh, so four questions, um, they'll explain their qualifications and then we'll um, basically end the Zoom and then people can just kind of go on up to the finalists if they're in the room and get to know them. Um, a little bit better. So again, that's 6.30 to 7.30 in the council chambers. And then Friday, um, April 9th, we'll start the morning with council interviews. So the council member will, will uh, meet with each candidate, um, you know, basically as a group um, for half an hour. And then um, after the council interviews in the morning, we'll do a city tour. Uh, we've got a few staff that are putting together a really great tour of the city, a one hour, um, we'll be taking the police minivan so we can um, you know, make sure we're not real scrunched into a city car. Um, and then following uh, the afternoon will be the mayor one-on-one -on -one interviews. So um, two really uh, fun-filled days. We're really excited about the finalists. Um, you know, as you know, we had about 31 applicants total. Um, we had 12 phone interviews, we had um, through the phone interviews, we came down to those four finalists. And uh, we were looking for candidates specifically who had senior level management experience. And so we, we found that in all four of those candidates. So uh, yeah, we're really excited. We hope to know who we're gonna be going with after the ninth. So um, I think that mayor's looking at the 13th council meeting to bring his recommendation for um, higher. We were looking at April 27th, but he might even do it sooner, um, you know, thinking that we'll have an answer hopefully on the 9th at, at the end of the day. So any questions about the process or any concerns or anything? Yeah, Gabriella. I just wanted to say I was part of the phone interview process and I thought the hiring process from, from my perspective so far has been really, really well done. Uh, and I appreciated, I appreciate how you run it and I'm really excited to see the final steps play out and participate in those interviews. One, my one question is for the council interviews. Will, we be, will there be an opportunity for the council and the mayor to have a discussion where we talk about what we think about the candidates or is it really just an opportunity for the council to meet them? Yep, so then the council will be able to meet with the candidates, but we do want the mayor and the council to talk afterwards. So after the council interviews are done in the morning, the mayor would come on in and just have a discussion and see how things are how you felt they went, what your thoughts and ideas were about the candidate. So yeah, we definitely want to have that communication between. So I did have to notice that uh, council was meeting as a group for Friday because there's a quorum. Um, so at the end of, you know, after you have your post-interview discussion, then we'll bring Aaron and then you'll have the opportunity to share how you felt about the candidate at that time. Will it be a closed session or is it yep. going to be open? To it's a closed session. We did file a Wisconsin statute that did allow for interviewing um, you know, possible employment um, that we could have a closed session. Yep. Great. Yep. Thanks. So which portion of that is closed? It'll be the entire part. So, um, you know, every from the moment that you're meeting with uh, the candidates to even when the mayor goes in there to kind of just ask you how, how it went. So 
um, we'll start the meeting off obviously in open, but then once you move into closed session, then at that time, it won't be um, open to the public. Okay. And what um, of both all, the totality of the two days, what options are there for public participation? Yeah, so we're going to tape the community panel presentation. So we, we will post those so that people can see those. Um, and then the public reception. So um, people will be able to um, see the candidates on the Zoom. Uh, they can come in person to talk to the candidates. Um, they can, if they do have some questions, um, you know, we haven't really talked about this yet, but if they have questions that they want to ask, but they can't be there in person, we could ask them to submit those questions. Uh, for public comment, um, you know, to me, and then we can we can try to address those at the public reception um, and get them get them answered. So yeah, we didn't. I guess we didn't talk about that part, but we definitely want to tape the community panel presentations, show those, um, and then also invite anyone who is interested to come to the public reception. And you know, we'll make sure people are wearing masks and we're um, socially distancing as much as possible in the council chambers. Okay, so if public has burning questions that they would like to have asked, mm -hmm. are they better off to send those to council members to ask? Or can, are there other alternatives for them? No, they can they can send it to council members. They could send it to me, um, they could, you know, for the public reception uh, evening. So there isn't a right or wrong. Um, if you feel comfortable getting questions and you'd like to ask those as part of the council um, interview, you can do that. Absolutely. I mean, I would, there, I, council, I would think the reception is going to become really tight and not have a lot of time for kind of public questions. Right. The council um, interview is meant to be more informal. So we do have one question that we want you to ask all of the candidates. But after that, um, it's more I get to know the, the finalists and ask your burning questions. So yes, so if you do get some questions from the public that you feel haven't already been addressed in the qualifications or the community panel presentation, absolutely, that would be a good time to ask those questions. Okay. And then if you get questions or other staff gets questions, um, from the public that would like to be asked, can you send those to council? Yes. So we can consider asking them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That would work for me. Okay. Tom, you have any questions back there? Yeah, I, uh, thanks, Dorothy. Um, I have a couple questions. I missed, I just missed it. What council date are you talking about? Yeah, so um, Aaron mentioned the 13th. So Tuesday, April 13th, it looks like there's a council meeting on the calendar. Wow. Okay. Nope, that's it. So it's April 13th? Okay. Yep. Um, the next question I have is, you talked about a panel, um, a five-person panel um, that the candidates will talk to at first. I have two questions on that. One is, are they, the panel, can we hear the names of the people on that panel? And two, um, is it a, a scoring? I'm going to make this up. One to five and five being the highest. I mean, how are we doing that as far as this panel goes? This panel sounds kind of important to me. And how is that being, how is that being done? Absolutely. Great question. So the five person panel, um, I have the names listed on the document that I sent to you. So we don't typically um, share who's going to be on interview panels um, ahead of time, just in case there's someone watching tonight. Um, we, I did share them though with the council. So if you check your email from this afternoon, I share a timeline of the two days and I include who exactly is going to be part of those processes. Okay. Um, absolutely. These are scored. So the panel interview is scored. The community panel presentation is scored. Um, we do have a, a rating a matrix. And um, so that will help the, the panel when they're scoring the candidates. So um, both of those components will be scored. And if the council, um, I'm going to make this up. If the council um, looks at candidate A and wants candidate A, does the mayor make the final choice, I'm assuming, and he likes candidate C? Um, he brings candidate C forward. Am I thinking right that the 
mayor has the first choice on this or does the yeah. council weigh into that? Yeah, it's the mayor's um, formal recommendation from there, though, um, you know, he, he speaks with the, the council and the council approves, um, but ultimately it's the mayor's recommendation for hire. Does, so if there, if their council wants one candidate and the mayor wants another candidate, I mean, there'll be that discussion on the 13th in closed session, um, but ultimately the mayor brings forth his recommendation for hire and then, and then there can be some discussion about that in the closed session. Okay, okay. Okay. And I'm assuming then just from what you said, I'm just wondering, that's all. Um, the council president has the same power and the same questions the rest of the council has at this point. Yep, exactly. Right. So have um, background checks been done on these four already? No. Or, and so how, how, how long does that would you expect that to take? Yeah, and so will we, that affect the timing? Yep, yep. So due to ban the box, we don't do background checks until we extend a conditional offer of employment. Sorry, my lights went out. Um, so once we extend the conditional offer of employment, then we run the, the background check. And we do hope to have a third party investigator that would pull would do the investigation. We're not doing this in house. Um, so I mean, it depends if it's um, you know, we don't know who the candidate's gonna be selected. Um, we are not sure exactly how long it's going to take. We're hoping that the investigation itself isn't um, longer than two to three weeks. Um, that's why we're hoping to bring the, the final recommendation to the 27th meeting, which would actually would only give us two weeks uh, for the investigation, but we don't wanna rush it. I mean, it's gonna be a thorough, thorough investigation. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're not exactly sure how long that will be, but no, we, we, we don't do background checks before uh, we bring people in for interviews. Okay, so what, what you said to be clear is until the mayor's choice has been made and announced, yep. you don't do a background check on that person until that point. Right, because then if there is something that bars that person from starting with us, we need to give them the opportunity to to contest, you know, what, what exactly is on their background that would um, prohibit them from being in the position. So, I mean, that's typically how we've been doing it since we implemented the ban the box, where we don't ask about criminal convictions at the time of applying. Um, we only do a background when once we've extended a contingent offer of employment. Um, we try to be as transparent as possible with our applicants when we're hiring. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we can move on to item B is city administrator contract review and discussion. Yeah, so I included in the packet uh, the contract for the administrator, it's a draft. So there were some changes made um, on the contract per our legal and Aaron, our mayor looked at it as well. So I just wanted to kind of go over some of those changes with you and then ask the personnel committee if they saw anything that uh, they felt should be updated on the draft city administrator contract. So um, if you look through the contract, I really just, we, we changed the pronouns from his to their, removed other gendered pronouns. Um, we removed sick and vacation starting bank because we can negotiate as needed once we've identified who that final candidate is. Sir, I've, I've got it in front of me. Could you just kind of flip through page by page? Yeah, yeah. let me share my screen. That, that might, would certainly be easiest for me. Yeah, yep. Let me open it up here on my end and then we can page through it together. Um, print on the packet. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, so if you start to look at the contract here, starting on page, that first page here, so hopefully you can see this on your screen okay. Um, so basically, like I said, we took off the, any gender pronouns um, trying to move my. 
Okay, so then we're, I'm gonna scroll down here. You'll see track, everything's track changes on this document. So if you go down to page three, um, there are some instances where the city administrator might need to attend meetings more than two days a week. So we just wanted to make sure that we didn't limit ourselves here. It's not all that, it's not common, but there may be some times where, where they need to attend more than two evenings in one week. Uh, so we removed that. And then if you scroll down here um, to page four, we talk about that sick leave vacation. So sick leave and vacation is something that we can negotiate with the city administrator candidate um, depending on their experience and, and what they're looking for. So we we did take that off. It, it means that we're just, we'll negotiate. We're, we're not sticking to what we have on there. We removed the mileage reimbursement because that's already covered in our employee handbook. So they will still get mileage reimbursement, but it just wasn't necessary to keep in the contract. Okay. And then we removed the... There was something in here about uh, you know mandatory making sure the city always paid for at least one national conference. Um, you know we removed that. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't want the city administrator to attend a national conference, but it just wouldn't obligate the city to um, to allow it. If, you know, if budget was really tight, if you know whatever the case might be, but you know it, of course it's very likely that they would always be going to a national conference every year. But again, we just don't want to obligate ourselves here. Right. And ab above there, you took out the um, potential yeah. for a, a private phone, basically. Yeah. yeah, so we do have a policy on the IT use and the employee handbook. Um, and so it, it, they, they would still get the mobile phone, but it would just have to be used. Um, it would have to be consistently used with what's the policy on IT use. So that's really, so they would still get the phone. It's just that we're kind of adding in the part that we have a policy in our employee handbook related to IT use. Okay, so let's stop and check for any questions. Gabriela? I do have several. Okay. Um, the first one is on page five. I think it's towards the bottom. It, it says, the base gross pay under this contract is limited to no more than 10% above the highest available rate in the city pay plan. Mm -hmm. is, I'm just curious about that, um, the specificity of that. Is that some sort of uh, standard practice that we have? Because I always thought, I thought that the range was sort of already set. Yeah, so we always have a differential between a supervisor and the incumbent in which and whom they supervise. And so we do have we do try to have that percentage um, difference between the two. So, for example, I mean, I think, um, you know, our, for example, our economic development uh, director is maybe one of our highest paid department heads. So we want to make sure there's at least a 10 percent difference between the highest paid department head and the city administrator. Um, highest paid department head in which the administrator supervises because uh, the mayor supervises the fire chief and the police chief, so they're not part of that equation there. But um, yeah, that's pretty standard that we have that uh, spread, that percentage spread between supervisors and the people that they supervise. Okay. Great. Anything else up to that point, Tom, for you? No, I'm good right now. Thanks. Okay. Then we can keep going. So that was... Um, the performance review yeah, that so, Gabby had, right? Yeah, the updates in the annual performance review that you're seeing here is just that there's not going to be a cost of leaving it increase for the city administrator if other staff don't get a COLA increase. Um, prior, it was like always making sure the city administrator was taken care of that they had a COLA, um, even if it wasn't in the budget for the, the, the non-represented employees. So um, we wanted to just make sure that was the same. And then we tied the raises to the pay for performance metrics um, because it's merit-based pay that we're on. So making sure that we, um, and we're moving to 360 feedback on top of it. So making sure that we're tying merit increases with our, our performance uh, metrics. And then we added, let's see. So people can holler out if they have questions as we go along. Yep. And then we added language to phase in six months of severance pay, depending on how long the city administrator is employed with the city. Um, 
So if you look here, we have length of employment and period of notice. Um, this is also for if they're giving um, a resignation notice, how long we're asking for them to, to let us know in advance. Uh, so for example, if someone's been here less than a year, please give us at least a month notice before leaving. Um, you know, if they've been here at least five years, but less than six, you know, give us six month notice. So um, we're hoping that will that will help us out so that we can more, you know, we can prepare for recruitment. Okay, on, on that bottom line, but less than six years, mm -hmm. but about after six years. Yeah, that's, I think that's how it should actually say. The note that I wrote to myself was at least five years mm -hmm. and thereafter. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. And then question oh, okay, on six and seven. There's four instances on this page of six and seven that reference like IE five or more votes to clarify that a majority of the council is five or more votes. I think we might want to eliminate that just in case the number of seats ever changes and oh, sure. the majority becomes more than five votes. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it might be better just to not have that. Okay. And I saw it four times. Okay. So probably put it down as a simple majority and leave the number yeah. out. I mean, the majority is, is very clear. It, like, when we say the word majority, I, th I think it has a very specific meaning in, in terms of voting. We, the, there, there's different kinds of majorities. There's a two-thirds majority. Okay, so, so simple majority, change it to simple majority. I think that, I mean. Okay, that's a really good, great recommendation. And we can't see it, Tom, so holler out if you have questions. I guess I have a question on that. Um, I. I understand just what you said. Um, does it hold more weight by two thirds versus a simple majority? I, I'm just asking a question on that. That's all. I'm, you know, if you just have a simple majority, um, boy, you could just, it could be a real close vote. I don't know. I'm just questioning that. Um, Sarah, has this always been in there or is it, um, I'm going to try to go back in time here a little bit. I understand um, the question, but I'm just wondering about the history. Yeah, it has always been in here. So um, this contract is exactly um, the one we had with Pat and then with Tony as well. So the only uh, changes are what you see in red. So otherwise everything else has been in here for several years. So we've always had five or more votes. Um, I, for the other two alders, I guess I just want to hear from them. I, I understand what's being said here, but I'm a little bit more concerned about the format and, um, well, if you want to go with simple majority, I guess, is that something the council should discuss? I, I think it's a pretty important step. That's all I'm saying. I think it's a pretty important step. And to just cross out and use simple majority, I think you may want to talk to other council members and get everybody's feet on that. I, on that, it's just, just a thought. Well, what, what's been written is five or more votes, which is simple majority. I okay. guess I, I guess in my in my experience okay. on the council, just to give some feedback, is I, I always thought that the two thirds or more was pretty much preserved for budgetary changes. And my assumption would be that any changes in the budget for an administrator position would be would be decided upon in the budget process. You know, we wouldn't pay someone more than was was budgeted, nor would we um, give them a cola raise unless that was part of the budget. So I guess the I guess my my initial thought, Tom, would be that okay. um, making this a two thirds vote would be distinct from any other type of vote that we take, unless I'm mistaken, I, and it's possible I'm mistaken on something I'm missing that I haven't voted on before. Okay. 
That's I, okay. I we can leave it. No, I'm, I'm just want to discuss that a little bit versus just, um, um, I guess I'm just going back a little bit in time, but um, no, I can be talked into that. That's fine. What, um, we, can go, we can go on. That's fine. I would, I would think an administrator would be working really hard to stay in favor with at least half the council. Yeah, that's, that's, that's if he's fair. Not a, if they are not able to do that, then we have a problem. I know. Uh, did the other alders have anything? Uh, uh, no. Um, before we go on, because you're going to go right by it, I, the residency, Sarah, res, the residency. Um, I have a question on that. Um, State law has changed on this, and I, I really get it that, um, you know, as far as people living within the city and out of the city now, I realize that that's all changed. But here's my question. It has to do with um, if the person is not living within the city, um, is there a mile requirement, like 40 miles or 50 miles? The reason I bring that up is if there's an emergency in the city and the administrator has to get here quickly, I sure wouldn't want them to live in Oak Creek or in Milwaukee or there's nothing been said about that. Um, not that, I mean, that's a little bit of a drive, I get it, but it's not spelled out here. Um, you could have an individual live in um, Johnson Creek and they would travel back and forth, I get that, but if there's an emergency or that person has to be here quick, um, I just want to raise that point. Is that do we have to narrow it to just a certain miles? I, I don't want it that short. I don't mean just to Monona or, I, but is there any mileage on that? Well, so the only issue with that is that's something we would have had to advertise at the beginning of the process. I mean, um, we do have an emergency management director, our fire chief. So if there is an emergency, we do have a department head that is, um, you know, is our is our main contact for that, and would be the first to respond and would allow for the city administrator to travel from where they are. Um, we haven't traditionally required any type of radius or mile. Um, you know, within uh, city hall or city uh, limits for the city administrator, um, just giving them this bonus if they happen to live in Fitchburg. Um, but if we were looking at requiring that as part of the contract, I would have wanted to do that at the very beginning of the process because I think that, you know, that could always, you know, hinder, I mean, that, that may or may not attract certain people to the position. Um, so, Again, you know, Joe, our fire chief, is our emergency management director, and so as such, you know, if, if there's an emergency, he'll be here. He lives within, he lives in the, in the city, um, and that would give time for the administrator to arrive wherever they are, whether they're in Madison or they're elsewhere. Um, but we haven't, we have not required that in the past. So, is the emergency management director expected to live in the city? I, I I would think so. Um, I don't have his job description in front of me right now, but I um, I would think that as a condition to be the emergency management director, that we need them to you know be within a certain mile radius or 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 something along those lines. Um, I, I I check here. I'm not positive on that. I guess I kind of question that the administrator has a $5,000 bonus for living in the city. I'm thinking no other staff has anything, anything like that at all, period. Correct. You're exactly right on that. And I would be somewhat irritated if I were staff saying, where's my bonus? But so I, I, I wouldn't have minded before the fact talking about eliminating that altogether, but I understand it's too late now. Well, it's not too late to get rid of a residency bonus. I mean, I mean that, I don't know that a city administrator when they apply would know that they would get an extra bonus for living in the, in the city of Fitchburg. What I'm saying is that if the, 
the contract required them to live within a certain mile radius of Fitchburg. Um, that would be an issue now because we didn't advertise the position as such. I hope that makes sense. So, I mean, there's still the ability to remove the residency bonus. We don't have to have that in the city administrator contract. Gabriella. I, this is an interesting discussion. I, I do actually like in trying to incentive, encouraging somebody to live in, in the city or near the city. So I, I thought that the incentive bonus was an interesting caveat. I guess my one question is, so obviously that that is, that's dependent on where that person moves. Is it possible that that's going to bring us beyond our top range for the salary? So like if, if we offer them the top salary and then they move into the city of Fitchburg, does that bring us $5,000 over the budget for the administrator salary? No, no, I don't believe it does. And um, let me look at this really quick here. Might be part of a negotiation of their salary um, that we would um, include that in. Well, I mean, of course, they still have to make at least 10% than the highest paid uh, department head, but then they would get that. Yeah, I mean, it does say they would, their salary would increase by $5,000 if they lived within the corporate limits of the city. So yeah, essentially it, it could be higher than the minimum of, for example, 150,000. I think this position started at 150,000 to ensure that they were 10% higher than the person they supervised. So yeah, they could be $5,000 higher by having living in the city. You have any thoughts, Tom? I kind of like your thought, Dorothy. Here's the deal on that. Um, I'm a big one for city government not to have um, bad blood with other department heads, with other city people. It's like um, there's a word for that. I'm trying to think what it is. Um, um, where People don't, I like your idea that if they're already that amount of money ahead, um, <laughs> just taking that out completely, they're already, if, am, I thinking, am I saying this right, Sarah, that they're uh, uh, the 10%, if they're 10% above the highest paid person, um, and then is 5,000 added on above that, or... Is, is 5,000 would be added on above that then. So that would Correct. be, that would be added on above, right? Correct. Plus I also consider the fact that they're saving time and commuting expense if they live in the city. So that's already a bonus to live in the city. Right, uh, Sarah, where did this come from? It's always been in the contract. It was in, um, you know, it was in Pat's contract. I don't know if it was in the prior contract, to be honest. Um, I know it was in this most recent one. So it's not a new addition. All right, can you do me a favor quick? Maybe you don't have it in front of you. So, Was this added in when we hired the past administrator? Because I don't think Tony Roach had this. Yeah, uh, let me check. I, I have access to that. One moment. It's a good question. Oh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's saved in this folder that I'm in right now. Um, I'd have to pull like the paper file. Um, I don't see it in here. It looks like 2000 might have been the year we hired Tony. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be in this folder I'm in. So I could find out and let you know if that was just something we did for um, the most recent administrator. 
is council going to have an opportunity to weigh in on questions like this before it's too late? I do believe that the account, the contract for city administrator would need to go to council for approval before we, before it, it's final. I will confirm with Valerie. Yeah. Because I, I think that's a big enough question that we probably should get more opinions mm -hmm. on it. The word I was gulping for, I didn't mean to interrupt, but the word I was gulping for was, and I think it's huge, I just think it's huge to the whole city, and I think the two alders I'm talking to will agree with me, it's called morale. The worst thing you want to do in the city is kill the morale. Once you do that, once you do that, people will leave. Trust me. They will leave. They will be um, talk about other department heads. Um, it'll go right down the tank. And I'm kind of on Dorothy's page on this. I, I wonder if we should just take this completely out and, um, and don't think that other city employees, because it's on the web, don't think they haven't already read this contract, because I'm sure they have. So, I mean, just food for thought. No. Gabriella. I mean, yeah, I, I, honestly, my, after hearing this conversation, I think my thinking has changed on it. So if, if, the, if it's the will of, the, uh, the, of you two to, to make a motion to remove that from the contract, I, I would be in support of that. I would take a motion from one of the two of you then. I'll make that motion for, it's called under the residency A. I'm on, I see if I'm, I know your page has changed. I'm on page, uh, it's actually on page 13, I believe. If I'm looking at this right, Sarah, and it's uh, the top of the page, it's on the residency. And all we're doing is just removing the residency portion. Correct. The Roman numeral is or seven whatever and it is. A. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's go. I'll, I'll vote for that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So that's unanimous in favor of removing the $5,000 bonus. Mm -hmm. And we will discuss that in council when it comes up because I think that is important. Um, uh, in, the meantime, in the meantime, sir, could you check on that? I have this feeling that uh, from previous mayors, this was added because the last, keep in mind, the last administrator was hired was under two mayors because we had a mayor that started and then a mayor that finished. So what the situation is you had two people here um, I'm not talking about the council. I'm just talking about the mayors. And um, so that was just food for thought. Okay. Yeah, I will find out about that and find out exactly when the contract comes back to council for approval as well. So I can get back to you on both of those. That's fine. Okay. Then we were up to the termination sections. Yeah. Um, I want to move my... So just really some, I mean, really minor um, updates here, still going for termination. Um, I mean, there isn't much of content added or updated here, if you kind of scroll through. So really, um, the, that was the meat of the contract that we went through and the changes that were made. Okay, one question that I had, um, A termination by administrator, I think it was, does not discuss at all uh, whether benefits are payable or not. Yeah, um, let me see if it does above here. Uh, 
Well, if, if the termination is by the administrator, though, I mean, they will be subject to COBRA, a continuation of benefits through that. Um, so really, the if, if it's a voluntary resignation, for example, um, and there's no separation agreement or anything like that, um, their benefits will continue through their last day, and then they can sign up for continuation of benefits. So there's nothing really unique there. They're treated like every other employee who leaves the city um, under resignation reasons. So that's oh. why there's nothing really in there. Uh, sick leave and vacation time and yep. things like that? Sick, yep, so sick leave's only um, paid out if you retire from the city. Um, you know, your vacation time's paid out if you have any that you didn't use. Uh, so it, I think the reason it's silent is because we, we treat them as a, a, a regular general employee um, and how they're paid out when they leave employment from the city. Okay. I, I was seeing it as an information hole. Okay. I can, I, can, I can mention that to um, our city attorney and just see if we want to maybe just restate that, you know, um, under that section. I think that might be good. And if we're done with that towards the end, I actually have one comment about the very first page, if we're okay going back. Yeah. So the very first page uh, under scope of duty is number three. I was going to propose a couple of changes to that okay. phrase. So the first sentence, instead of using the word alternatives, policy alternatives, call say policy advice. Okay. And then for that last sentence, recommends the best courses of action. I guess my preference would would be for it to say something like provides guidance, advice, and recommendations on a course of action, so that it, it's less about telling us what the best course of action is and more providing advice. Okay. And I can send you that language if that's helpful. I can I can even show it. Um, yeah, if you Gabrielle, can you just repeat it? So you said recommend guidance, advice. Yes. So for the for that number three, the first yep. sentence change it to provides information and policy advice to the mayor yep. and council. And the third sentence in that stanza would be provides guidance, advice, and recommendations on a course of action for each problem situation or event. Perfect, thank you. All right. Anything between there and Roman numeral 10, it would be at this point. So we can go on and probably finish up. Mm -hmm. For um, records and files, one, one of the notes that I wrote to myself is, is there anything in it about records that might that they may have on personal devices when they leave. Mm. If if they happen to have a personal computer that they were using from home, that might have records on it. Um, can we ask for that to be given over to the city, or is that? I can talk to our attorney and our IT director and see if that's something that we can. Um, require. I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know that they ever really use personal devices. They're given a city laptop and a city cell phone, and I think they're instructed to not use personal IT um, equipment that belongs to them for city business. I think we're pretty strict on that. Um, that goes for all employees. So, um, although I, I realize sometimes people have personal cell phones that they might send. Um, you know, use on emails or documents or whatever the case might be. So let me look into that a little bit more, Dorothy, and I can get back to you when I email about the other two items. Okay. Okay. 
and everything down to political activity has no changes. Any questions in anything there? So political activity. I think that section just it just has the minor pronoun change. Um, but a question that I wrote to myself is, um, should there be anything in there related to testifying at political at political hearings, like at the state capitol or anything? Um, Are you kind of seeing? Yeah, so you're talking about political activity, adding in something about whether or not they're testifying at some type of event or hearing. Yeah, I was thinking uh, committee hearings at, at the state capitol sort of things. Okay. I just wonder if that's covered under free speech. That would be my question. Mm -hmm. I will need to work with our legal and just um, inquire about that. One of my questions too is under political activity um, number C. It says being a candidate for any elective government office in a partisan primary, general or special election, but all local and county government positions are nonpartisan. So does that mean that this person's eligible for local and county positions? So they, they, can be on, they can be on a school board, say. Yeah. Is that what it says, Sarah? So that is what it says. Um, I don't know that anyone's ever challenged that or wanted to change that. Um, is this something that you'd like to see changed? I guess I just don't know what best practice is. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know if it was the intention. Oh, I don't know if the intention was it for, for it to only be at that state level, state or federal level. Because I, and I don't know if maybe this is standard language and in, in other states, local government races are partisan. I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. I just wanted to ask it because it was very clearly said partisan, um, which yeah. includes local county and, and school board government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll find out. Um, with our contracts, we always review this with our employment attorneys. So I do think that this is pretty standard um, contract language for um, you know employment contracts. But let me uh, check into that with him and just see if we need to add um, whether we need to add the nonpartisan to that or why the difference. Why why we say partisan but not nonpartisan. Because I would think that we wouldn't want them running for Fitchburg City Council or Madison <laughs> School Board. And like technically that's not precluded from this mm -hmm. agreement. Brad. Yeah, I would think what might happen is if they live off in Village X, um, they might be on the Village Board in addition to being our administrator. Those but it seems like they would be precluded by the by like not being allowed to provide advice or municipal services to other because isn't there something in the contract about not being able to provide services without express consent from the mayor uh, there might be actually i can't off the top of my head is it under absence from city no. um, i'm trying Maybe under here, exclusive service. The administrator may teach courses in local government or public administration at local colleges, universities with prior written permission of the mayor. That's not really it. Um, Cause that seems like that excludes pretty much all local government. Cause local government, even though they're, they're part-time positions, they are technically paid. Mm -hmm. They're not volunteers, so. I don't know, maybe, maybe it would be redundant to say that um, in the political activity section. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll, we'll look too. at that too, Gabriella. 
I guess I, sir, um, <clears throat> I think you two raised a good point. And let's say the administrator lives in McFarland and wants to run for the school board of McFarland. Um, he checks with the mayor and the mayor says no or yes, but the fact is, is I would think he could do that. I would think he, under our constitution, I mean, he could do that. He could run for a school board if he wanted to. It's not our school district. It's not our, um, you know, I would encourage him to do it. I mean, if I was a mayor, I'd say, look, that's, that's a good position. And uh, it has nothing to do with our three s school systems. And uh, is he, profit can or can't he do that, I guess is my question. I don't see why, I, so I think this contract can really be what we are what we really need from the administrator. I mean, if we don't see an issue with that, then we'll want to make sure this contract doesn't point itself into an issue with that. Um, I think if we need to reword some things um, or we want to make it more transparent, we can do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it, this, Excluding nonpartisan races from the political activity opens it up for a scenario like Tom said about, you know, someone running from McFarland School Board. Mm -hmm. The exclusive service section would make it a requirement that they'd have to get approval from the mayor in order right. to do that because it's a paid position providing services to a municipality. So it sounds like we're covered, like the person would have to get approval in order to do that. And that seems like what we'd want some sort of check on it. We wouldn't want it to just be able to go through. And it seems like that exclusive service part of the contract clarifies that. Okay. Yep. Agreed. All right. And moving on down the line. Okay. Miscellaneous and some signatures. So is that the end of discussion on that? And if there's no other questions or comments on it, then let's move to discussion and possible motion to approve recommendation to change negotiation of vacation accrual. <laughs> Tell us what that's about, Sarah. Absolutely. So um, the issue that we have right now, we're trying to look at all of our policies through an equity lens, and we have a stellar um, candidate for a position right now. Uh, it's a non-exempt position in our water utility, and he has um, at least 12 years of experience doing this type of work that, um, you know, the, the kind of work that we need to fill. And so he um, he's unable to negotiate vacation time. All of our exempt employees or exempt new hires have that ability to no negotiate vacation time. So, um, you know, we're as we're thinking about this, you know, we, we've been asking ourselves, okay, well, why do we allow higher paid exempt employees to negotiate paid time or vacation time when they start, but not our uh, lower paid, not exempt employees? Now we do understand we don't, this isn't something we advertise, so to speak. So um, this is something where we extend an offer and new hire says, well, um, you know, I, I'm currently at this many uh, weeks. I have these qualifications. Maybe it's a really hard to fill job. Um, that's when we would use this ability, but we're, we're simply looking for the, the possibility to allow for vacation negotiation for our non-exempt employees. Because like right now with this candidate, we cannot, um, we, we simply can just be, all we can say is no at this time. So um, it is it is a deal breaker for this candidate. So it is um, just trying to see how we can be a more flexible and um have that opportunity for all new hires. Um, if, it, if, it, if they have really great qualifications, we have um, not enough um, qualified applicants and we're able to potentially bring someone on because we can negotiate. So I hope that makes sense. So what I'm asking the personnel committee for is, you know, your discussion, your thoughts on, on changing that. You know, traditionally, I think we've, we've allowed only exempt employees to negotiate vacation because a lot of times they're harder to fill positions, they're manage, manager level positions. Um, 
you know, sometimes to attract someone over to us, we need to offer not just higher pay, but higher vacation accrual. Um, so, you know, here we have a supervisor level position, even though typically you would think a supervisor would be exempt. Uh, this, this position does a lot of um, field work with his crews, with their crews. So um, it is not exempt. So we, we just want that ability to negotiate. Particularly, Tom, if you need to know where to find what we're talking about, it's on page 68 in the packet. Yeah, I'll bring up the, uh, I'll share my screen so you can see the policy that we have in place here. And my, my question is, um, how are you suggesting changing the wording? Yeah, so I would simply, if you look at page 68 here, I would simply be going down to see the second paragraph uh, after the whole chart of vacation available. Uh, it would say, when hiring a new employee, a new uh, yeah, just new employee who has experience with an employer that participates in the Wisconsin retirement system, the city administrator may offer up the amount of vacation time that a current city employee would be entitled to. So really it's, it's only adding, it's removing the new, the exempt from, and just saying when hiring a new employee, um, again, these, this employee handbook is for our general employees. So, I mean, this doesn't apply to our represented police and fire employees. I do want to point that out. But again, we already offer this ability to negotiate for our non-represented exempt staff. And so we're trying to figure out how we can still attract talented employees um, with um, who, that have this experience. Yep. Go ahead, Gabby. I'm, I'm of the thought that you should have some flexibility in negotiation because, and I think we've been moving towards that even this year, just making sure that we have policies in place that we can attract the best people. Um, and so negotiating on vacation time seems like a reasonable thing that you should be able to do to get the best person in there. My, my question, I guess, so I have no problem with this change you're suggesting. I support this. That being said, when I actually read the language in the non-exempt section, um, it's very specific saying that who has hiring a new exempt employee who has experience with an employer that participates in WRS, they may offer up to the amount of vacation time like, like that's a very specific, that doesn't seem like that's giving you a lot of leverage to negotiate. Um, right, you're, you're exactly right. It, it is a, um, it's still requiring Wisconsin retirement uh, service experience. So it's like from someone coming from one municipality to another. Um, traditionally why they've had that in there is, I don't know, maybe to limit the number of people that can negotiate their vacation time and to be competitive with neighboring municipalities when we try to bring somebody over. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, the language itself is still limiting because we're only really allowing negotiation for WRS. But if you go to the next paragraph, we also say here though, that when hiring any other new exempt employee, again, we wanna take out the exempt and just say, when hiring any other new employee, the city administrator may offer a higher step on the vacation schedule based on prior experience with the approval of the personnel committee, but that amount shall not exceed the amount to which a current city employee would be entitled with identical years of service. Um, so that does give us the flexibility um, of, to, to negotiate vacation time for those that don't have WRS experience. It's weird how it's written in one paragraph and then you got to go to the next one, but it does allow for you to have that flexibility with any new hire, well, any exempt employee as it's written today, but hopefully in the future for any new hire. And it needs to come before the personnel committee or does that, I mean, like, do we want that type of, like that type of specific oversight for a particular individual employment offer? So I, I I am all for removing additional steps if, if the personnel committee is okay with that. I mean, I, it doesn't happen a lot by any means. Um, it rarely happens, to be honest, where we negotiate vacation time. But again, like it's like we find ourselves in a situation right now where we're going to lose a really great qualified candidate because he, he gets five weeks of vacation. We're not going to be able to bring him in at five weeks because he has 12 years, so it'll be four weeks. But still, it's much better than the, the two weeks that he would be starting at. So if, if you'd like to remove with the approval of the personnel committee, um, you know, we can, it still would go through city administrator, finance director and HR manager approval. So it's not like it wouldn't be approved by multiple people. And we could put that in there. We could say with the approval of the city administrator, finance director, um, and HR manager, or just the city administrator. 
I would make a motion to remove that with approval of the personnel committee. I don't think I, I need to be looking at an individual employment contract when we have professionals on staff that are doing that, um, as long as it's in, in compliance with our policies. And I also support extending that type of what you, what is laid out here for non-exempt employees to exempt employees. So I, I make a motion to remove that with the approval of the personnel committee. All right, so we can vote on that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that's all three of us. Um, Can I make a motion to extend it to the exempt employees then? Or is there, does there need to be a motion? So your motion just approved the language to remove the exempt, exempt. so it's open to exempt or non-exempt so that they, they're one. So yep, so we're good now. And the incumbent that we have um, is coming from a, a WRS employer. So I wouldn't have had to come to the personnel committee, but if you were in the different situation, yeah, today I would have been bringing you two actions, one to, well, one to change the, la the language and then one to approve his higher vacation. But because he's a, with another municipality, that's WRS, we won't need to do that. And now we won't need to do that in the future because of the change, so thank you. All right, so you, you're not seeing any, because if they, if they start with four weeks, that means every future year they're going to be with that same again. Right, so this person would stay then until they get to the 20 years and then would see the, the, the increase to 200 hours. Um, so even though they're brand new with us and don't have 12 years with us, they're not going to see their next bump until they've been with, with us for 20 years. Okay. And are there any other um, employees that are going to grumble about that that you can think of? So we have a public works department. Um, this is for a water utility supervisor. So he is, um, this is the only position that we have in the water utility um, in that classification. Um, you know, again, this person has that 12 years of WRS in that position. So um, I don't see any issues or grumblings of why, um, you know, that would be an issue by any means. Okay. Yeah, Todd, Todd would say don't create bad blood among other employees so sounds like not yeah. anything from you tom no you're good um yeah. i guess if there's a question sarah i you know uh if there's a question i'm sure your thoughts are probably like this too though um if there's a question about this in the future and i know what gabriel just removed but if there's a question or you have a uh hesitation, you can always bring it back to the personnel committee. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You know, I mean, yep. just a thought. Yep. It's not written in stone, I don't think, in your head that, you you know, we're not ever going to, you could just bring it back if you had to. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Food for thought. That's all. I don't, knowing it's harder to put back than it is to remove. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. All right. Anything else on that? Otherwise, we can go to report from department. Right. I'm going to take you to it. Share my keep sharing my screen here. Um, so if you've seen our job postings lately on the website, you'll see that we have had a lot of openings. Um, we've experienced kind of a tsunami of turnover in 2021 already. Um, I through my professional associations, um, I'm also seeing that that's kind of the trend already this year and that that's expected. Um, I don't know after the pandemic if people have just been kind of rethinking uh, what exactly they want to do. We've had some life changes people put in for retirements where last year we had the lowest turnover that we've had in over five years. Um, so if you look at our um, hires just since January, when we've hired a full time, these are full time and uh, permanent part-time employees, a full-time police officer, uh, two part-time library assistants, a full-time public works maintenance worker, our full-time engineering tech, and a full-time accounting clerk. Um, we hired a couple of uh, shelvers and a new groundskeeper. But if you look at our current recruitments in progress, it's um, we got a lot of them. So of course, as you know, we've got the city administrator, we've got a commercial property appraiser, um, we did extend an offer and he got a better offer where he was at. So we lost um, a really stellar candidate. 
Um, so we have it posted again. We're accepting applications. It's a hard um, assessing positions, particularly commercial appraisers, are really hard to find. Um, so we're doing the best we can here um, to get that filled as fast as possible for Amy and assessing. Um, we have a full-time community center recreation choir that actually closed last night. We had almost 100 applicants for that one. Um, that one's a really popular position. Uh, that, that's an assistant in our recreation department. So if you recall, we had the layoff discussions of the two recreation employees late last year. And um, he did leave um, to move back home, um, closer to home and a new opportunity. But reading his exit survey, um, he definitely was disappointed in the whole layoff discussion. It kind of, you know, left a bad taste in his mouth, unfortunately. So, um, you know, that that's hard to hear. And, you know, I talked with him and I just, um, you know, we really appreciated them moving into parks and helping the parks out last year during the summer and um, when typically they would be running recreation programs. So um, we're just eager for um, to get this position filled so that we can keep them busy in recreation. Hopefully we never have this layoff situation again. I don't anticipate that we would have that again, just that was something particular to the pandemic. And then uh, we're doing a, a, a recruitment process in collaboration with the city of Madison. This is for specifically the town of Madison police officers. So as you know, um, they have some officers that will be needing employment after this year. So uh, the city of Madison has a active posting and we have an active posting. And so we're gonna be doing joint interviews and then be making joint um, offer calls. So we have kind of a, a kind of neat process that has been approved by the police and fire commission to see um, how we're going to do this. There are some Town of Madison officers that only want to work for Fitchburg, and then there's some that only want to work for Madison, and then we do have some that don't mind either way. So um, they'll have to go through the whole recruitment process just as um, any other applicant for a police officer position. So they go through the essay questions, they go through the interviews, uh, the chief interviews. So it's still, it's a, a basically an identical process, except we're doing this with the city of Madison. And then we have this utility supervisor. This is the position I talked to you a little bit about um, earlier about the vacation time that offer has been placed. Um, so we're just trying to work things out so that um, we can get him started. And then we have a entry level police officer. We're, we're hoping to make three hires. Uh, they're going through the background check stage right now of about six uh, candidates. And then we have fire science interns that we just held interviews for and then our paid on call firefighters. We're finalizing the start date after April, uh, Police and Fire Commission. And all of our summer positions are posted too. So if you know anyone looking for summer positions uh, in recreation or parks, um, now is the time to apply. So turnover. So I did post, you know, kind of reasons for people leaving, you know, as you know, um, this administrator resignation, commercial property appraiser left to be closer uh, to home with working less hours. Uh, we had two police officers leave that left um, due to um, working outside of policing. So they left uh, the police force altogether. Um, we have an engineering tech too that left to be in a different location uh, further from here. Um, and then accounting clerk too that left for personal reasons to be home more. Um, and then a recreation assistant that moved back home, but also I shared with you about the recreation layoff concerns. And then our utility supervisor retired. Any questions about new hires and termination or uh, resignations, terminations type of deal? Gabby, yeah. one more question. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. Oh, um, just had a question, uh, Sarah, you know, I'm trying to take advantage of Madison College and the university. Um, do we have any site that um, we can post? I'm going to say it two ways. The summer help, you know, for the college students, as well as. Turn your mic off, Tom. Um, um, I mean, we're right in the backyard of this, these two colleges, and um, we could tap into, or maybe we've already. Uh, I'm yeah, a big, we, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, we always post to the, the near colleges. So the whole Tech Connect, our UW schools, there's something called BuckyNet um, that Amy, our HR specialist, uses to post all summer um, opportunities. So yeah, and so we definitely utilize that. Um, and we've also reached out to area high schools too, Verona, Oregon, um, because if they're 18, uh, they can work in the parks, for example. So we are trying to work with the guidance counselors, counselors over there if they have anyone who's 18. Uh, senior, for example, who's looking for employment for the summer. Ne Nehemiah would be another suggestion. I know you're oh, quite okay. familiar with them. Yep, yep. Gabriella. I'll, I'll, I'll ask one too. Are you done taking notes? I don't want to interrupt yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the entry level police officer positions, I assume that that comes with training. We train, we send them to the police academy for training. Exactly. And I know that those hiring decisions are up to the police and fire commission, but I'm curious, do we work on hiring people that already live in the community or is it typically people from outside of the community? Oh, so we invite anyone who is interested in being an officer. I mean, if they live in the community, that's wonderful. If they don't, um, we don't, um, we don't give, um, you know, preference points, so to speak, for someone that lives in Fitchburg. But, um, you know, we have a lot of people actually that apply that have already been through the, the police academy. And then now we're getting a lot more of uh, the laterals, meaning there are police officers already working at other municipalities that are applying to basically transfer to Fitchburg, making higher salary and higher vacation. I mean, what I mean is they come in at a higher rate of pay, higher vacation, for example, if they already have police officer experience. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, the bulk of the new hires do have to go through the academy, but um, I mean, some of them are from our local. We definitely see local, um, you know, Dane County um, applicants, but we also see, a, we do see a few out of state. It just would be great to say, I, mean, I guess I don't know if we do any specific recruiting within the city of Fitchburg, because it just seems like it'd be great to have some applicants Obviously, they would go through the hiring process and they might not get chosen, but it'd be great to have people that, because it's an entry level that comes with the opportunity for training, mm -hmm. it would be great to have someone that already knows Fitchburg neighborhoods to apply and potentially be considered. So, I don't Absolutely. Know. We're trying to rethink our recruitment strategy with police officers because, you know, every recruitment, it's getting lower and lower with the number of applicants. I mean, back years ago, we would see three to 400 applications come through. Um, in the last, like maybe two years ago, it was like 150. Now we're lucky if we make 80 applications. Um, so it's, it's every year, it's just getting uh, less and less. So we're trying to figure out what we can do um, to attract more people. And also what's our communication with everybody at different stages in the process. We had 20 people not schedule an interview for police officer in our last hiring process. So are our notices um, scaring people away? Are they intimidating? You know, it, th there, there's things that we need to look at and maybe make some changes to. Um, we're thinking about putting a focus group together to look at all the different stages of the process um, to see what we can do differently. So we're, we're going to really try to um, revamp some things here sooner than later because we can't keep doing what we're doing because it's not yielding uh, the greatest results. Any sense of whether similar things are happening in other municipalities as well, or is it specific to us? No, this is all, all over um, in police departments. So uh, City of Madison has seen a decrease in the number of applications coming through, um, smaller municipalities even less. So yeah, it's, it's universal. Kind of changing the topic a little bit, I think I've suggested before, but I'd like to suggest again that um, police and fire talk about uh, ban the box for fire service so that people that have something that they would like to talk about in their background so their um, applications aren't getting tossed because of an answer on the application. Yeah, so the, the Wisconsin Law Enforcement Standards Board requires that all um, police officers do not have any felonies. So we that's one of the mandatory questions we have to put on the application for police officer. And if they have a felony, that's an automatic disqualification. So that, that's one of the reasons we can't necessarily ban the box for police because that is one of the requirements. 
um, per the standards board of Wisconsin. So um, the fire positions on the other hand are a little bit different. Um, so I, we, we don't have to ask that when it comes to our fire positions, but for our police, we, we certainly do. Yep, I understood that. Okay. So, and I, I specifically said um, for fire service. Oh, okay. So I, I'd, I'd like to give people an opportunity um, to explain something because I, I know there's a lot of people that have a burning desire to be a firefighter. And if they can't because you have to check a box that they know gets their application tossed, then you're automatically eliminating a lot of potentially excellent people. Agreed. Yep, absolutely. We'll have to make sure that all of our fire postings um, have that removed because again, I don't recall that there's a requirement on the fire side. Um, so um, after turnover, I just talk a little bit about initiatives. So we're working on a big 360 feedback for all department heads. Um, this includes for the city administrator too. So I was really hopeful to have um, the completed product to you in this uh, meeting, um, but that the city administrator process took a little bit more time than I realized, as well as a number of different other things. So um, it is something that has to get done though here, at least in the second quarter. So I will definitely be bringing this forward. Um, and we're getting a focus group together to help us look at, okay, how would this look? What, it, how, you know, what exactly are the questions? Who's gonna be rating if we're doing 360 feedback? Um, so we do, we will have a, a nice, good, thorough program with, you know, participation by, by employees uh, to be part of this. And then if it goes well for department heads, who knows, maybe it's something for the future for all staff. I mean, you just never know, but first department heads will be the ones to, to get that 360 feedback. And then um, we're going completely paperless. We're trying to convert all of our electronic personal or all of our paper personnel files into electronic personnel files. So um, we've already started the process with our new hire. So it's kind of neat. We no longer are making actual physical files for our new hires. So um, that, that's kind of nice. So I have all these filing cabinets I'll be able to get rid of, but. <laughs> And then um, our the city safety team and diversity inclusion employee resource group will continue to meet. Our safety team meets second quarter. Diversity inclusion at ERG meets every month. Um, we've broken into some focus groups. So it's been really great. Mandy Miller is our um, kind of the lead on our ERG and she would like to put together a, a presentation for one of the upcoming COW uh, Committee of the Whole and um, with an, a couple other members of the ERG to kind of share with you what we're up to. Um, we've got a focus group uh, looking at education and training to hiring and recruitment to um, you know retention. So we're, we're just, we're looking at a number of different things and um, our focus groups are coming up with some really great ideas. So um, I'm really excited to see the future things that come out of this group because already, I mean, right now we're going through black history training. Um, we, we've already started to put some things into place here. So um, we take minutes, we have agendas. So if you ever want to see any of that, we have all of that on a, um, the inter, the interdepartmental file or folder. So we keep track of all of that. And then, yeah, future projects, you know, research and cost benefit analysis of paid parental leave, you know, um, looking at federal legislation, you know, from a Biden, who knows, maybe paid parental leave will be something that we will mandatory have to do. Um, but this is something that's been on my wish list for at least a couple of years now. Um, and then looking at the creation of a donated vacation policy. So if you have an employee who needs to be out for an emergency, maybe they're uh, really ill or they have a family member that is going to be um, really ill that needs they need to be out for, it would be great if we have um, employees that have all this vacation time that are going to lose it um, because they can only carry over so much. If they want to donate, that it could go to an employee in need. So um, that's always been something that I wanted to do. And then, of course, the city succession plan. We have a lot of um, employees nearing retirement age, so we need to kind of start thinking ahead of how we're going to proactively fill their positions. That's my HR report for you. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I wanted to go back to um, the I IT and new hires. Um, that made me wonder uh, what we're able to do for 
uh, people that either don't have uh, computers or don't have decent internet or whatever that have a hard time accessing the ability to uh, work online to get hired. Yeah, so they don't have to, um, like this is the paperless system, like they could come in on their first day and they can complete this on the computer here too. So it's not something they have to do before they start on a computer. Um, applying for a position, you know, right now we only accept online applications. So we still have that, um, you know, we've got our libraries. If someone ever needed um, assistance with finding a computer, um, they could always reach out. They, it's also, um, you can apply using a handheld device. So whether it's a phone or a tablet. Um, so I, I'm not, you know, we do have the computers here on their first day where then they can, they can do some of those. Otherwise they can also complete it, um, you know, the paper form when they come in on their first day and we can just scan it in and we, we save it in their personnel file. So it's not going to um, uh, leave us in a position where we're not hiring people because they don't have access to the technology. Um, again, like if they come on their first day and don't have some of these papers uh, filled out from uh, the computer onboarding, then we can just give them the, the paper forms and we can, we can just scan that into their electronic personnel file. And then we also have ready access to hard copy applications that people can pick up at City Hall. So if someone needed something printed, yeah. So if someone's going through and looking at applications, are you talking about like part of an interview process or? Well, if people want to apply for a position. Mm -hmm. If they... someone wants to apply for a position, um, we can help them manually enter their um, application. Uh, we, we have given paper application forms out at request, so that's that's fine. We can definitely do that. And then we can just manually enter their application into our online applications. That's no problem. We've done that before. Okay. I'd, I'd like to, especially when we're talking about Nehemiah and Madison College and um, yeah. things like that, I, I'd like to be sure that we're able to help people that might need a little bit of a hand with the technology issues. Absolutely. And if anyone needed help uh, just walking through the online system, they could always call any one of us in HR. We'd be more than happy to meet with them. They could, we could have, and have them come into the library, for example, and sit down with them and, and walk through how to apply. We would be more than happy to do that. Cool. Either Gabrielle or Tom, more questions? I just have a comment. Um, you know, looking at all the openings we have and looking at other cities and towns having the same problem and just kind of what you said, Sarah, I mean, I think that the time has changed that we should do this in a different way or something has to be added. And my ad is, um, People's time is very important. I'm going to say that right from the beginning. But I'm wondering if we shouldn't have a day in Fitchburg where you get three applicants from the highway department, there's an opening, uh, two cops, that there's an opening, and they just come over, they get the application, but they actually come to the city and go around with somebody just for like maybe two hours in don't do anything else. Don't give them a yes or a no. Or, but my point is that maybe if they saw the city and were more interested in the city, it would get them more excited to stay here. Um, I think that everybody's going through the same problem right now. And this isn't a one-shoe-fits-all. Uh, um, what you're, and I think you're headed in that direction, but you've got to do something to get candidates through the door, and then once they're through the door, they want to stay here. Um, but, you know, that's not always the case. So I'm, I think through this process, what you're talking about, uh, I know you've thought about it. I'm sure you thinking about things, but I'm calling it just time is important to people. And that's why you notice I didn't say all day or half a day. They won't want to come, but maybe just, and if say they turn it down, 
and they give an application, but they don't want to come for like an hour or two, that's okay. But you're going to have to do something different to get more interest in the city of Fitchburg. Oh, yeah. Believe me, <laughs> we've, we've had some really interesting conversations about things that we can do. Um, Juan Hinihos uh, uh, with the police department, he, him and I were talking about an open house in the police department, you know, just having people come through and meeting with other officers and um, seeing the department. And, you know, having an open house, I think, is a great idea, especially as we uh, rear the end of this pandemic, hopefully, in Eckenwood. Um, you know, maybe we can have some more interactions with um, people, invite them into City Hall, invite them into the library, for example, and uh, we can have those those meetings with people. And even on-site interviews, I love that concept. Um, you know, if we have summer seasonal positions, if people can come apply and then right afterwards go in for a quick interview, um, you know, whatever we can do to help, uh, you know, make it more of a seamless transition and not, all right, I apply and then two weeks later I get invited to an interview and then two weeks later, you know what I mean? It's trying to see how, what we can do to be more efficient. Before we wrap up, I'd like to get a COVID update for how, how how many people are still working from home, how, how open the buildings are and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, currently we have only about 45 employees left who are um, waiting to be eligible for the vaccination. So next week they will be eligible. Um, otherwise, all of our other staff, um, we've got about 270 staff. Um, so the remaining have all had the opportunity. So. Um, we do have quite a few that are still working from home. Um, I shouldn't say quite a few. Our police and fire departments are all back. Um, our, um, well, they've never not been here. They've all been you know, on the front line. Our public works have been on the front line. Our assessing department's always been here. Our finance department has always been here. Um, so it's not a large amount of staff that are working from home. I'd say um, you know, some engineers, some planners, um, you know, some in administration, um, it's, you know, people are still coming into the office though. It's just not five days a week, all day. Um, I do anticipate once we have our soft opening and then our, our hard opening, I think we're looking at, um, doing a for sure opening of city hall June 1st. So that will be doors are open. People can come on in, make appointments, meet with people, drop things off. Um, I think when that happens, you know, everyone, every department will have to have coverage and that's really important. So, um, you know, you'll see a little less of working from home, but the telecommuting agreement um, that, that was approved, you know, does allow for telecommuting even after the pandemic. It wasn't a, a policy that only went into play because of a pandemic. So, um, you know, the goal is to still allow that flexibility for our staff, but of course, you know, the number one is that the, the community is being served, people can be, can get a hold of, answers can be, um, you know, can, people can get answers to the questions that they have. So that's number one. Um, but otherwise, um, COVID, our COVID emergency paid sick leave expired at the end of March. So uh, what that means is that if someone has COVID or they have a family member that has COVID, they don't, they are no longer eligible for emergency paid sick leave, um, but they can use their sick time. Um, we're giving people their sick uh, time that is all the way accrued through the end of this year so they can tap into future accrued sick time. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, I have seen a, a huge decrease in the number of people who had to be out for COVID in March. So um, it, it's been nice to see. It was real heavy in January. Um, and then, of course, March has gotten really, really nice. I think we only had maybe two employees total that had to be out in March for COVID. So I hope that answers your questions. Yep, just a general sense. I want to piggyback on that, uh, if I can, just for a second. Uh, I know that, you know, I've had a couple ladies call me and I think the city is really going to be criticized if we open the city hall and not the library. The situation is um, there's a lot of people that want to use that library. Now, I know I'm not talking to the library board. I get it. But all I'm saying is that it's a very expensive building. It's a building people want to get into. Our schools are opening. Um, the grocery store is open. The cops, the firefighters, you named a bunch of them that are already open. Just food for thought, um, you know, if you open City Hall, I think you want to 
kind of get that library open and um, not hold people back from that library, um, mm -hmm. especially the schools. As I said, I'm going to say that again. The schools are opening. Um, I, I just think that building should be open, and I don't know what the conversation was, but something tells me that the city hall is going to open, and then the library is going to open a month later or two months later. Or so. It can't be. It can't be. It should be simultaneously. Some, is there a holdup or a reason why? I know, um, like I say, I don't want to go too farther in this, but uh, uh, I think I remember hearing Mike Zimmerman talking about uh, well, the city hall is going to open, and then Randy was talking about the library, and I get that, but is there anything that we can do this together? Yeah, I think that the library is actually opening before us. Um, I think that there was maybe some a communication that went out um, maybe today. I think I heard, I think Mayor mentioned, um, I don't know the exact day, but I want to say it was sometime in May. And then we were looking at opening in June. I think we were going to try to open everything at the same time. So maybe that changes City Hall okay. and what we're going to do. But um, number one is we need to make sure that everyone who who works here, who hasn't had the opportunity to get vaccinated, is gets that opportunity first before we open. And that's why it's great that next week um, the doors have really opened for people to get that because... Um, Quite a few that the four of the 45 that are actually ones that work in this building that, that have not had the opportunity to get vaccinated. So. But yeah, I think the library is opening sooner than than we think. If it came out today, I didn't see it, so that's fine. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not sure if it went out to everybody or who it went out to, but I, I do know Aaron mentioned something. Okay, okay, that's fine. Oh. Anything else from anyone? All in, all done. Make a motion to adjourn. I'll move adjournment. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>